And welcome to a new episode of PR360, and I'm your host, Brett Dice. Please just subscribe to PR360 to give us a good review because it always helps spread the love and knowledge of PR360 and PR because we all need that as well. But this week, I have Christine with me, and she is basically a huge proponent of personal branding but she also is a personal branding expert as well and she just just going to share her knowledge on that because we all need a little bit of personal branding i need help every once in a while because i'm like should i post this should i not post this how is this really going to work out for my own personal brand so that's what we're going to be talking about today so welcome to the show christine thanks for having me brett and the first question i ask all my guests is are you a coffee or tea drinker I am a coffee drinker, definitely. No hate for tea, but I have a lot of Irish roots, but coffee. Do you have any like specific coffees that you like? Uh, well, in the morning, I have a hot coffee, and I get uh, locally roasted beans from Coffee Labs Roasters in Tarrytown, New York. And then throughout the day, I like iced coffee. And I've found, I know instant can be considered a crime, but I like iced coffee made with Bustello instant espresso powder. So that's my jam for the rest of the day. I have to turn to decaf after about noonish, but yeah, instant instant espresso powder for the iced coffees. Nice, no, no worries about that. If you like coffee your way, what matters really? <laughs> it's, it's what you like. <laughs> and I gave a brief explanation about your expertise. Can you summarize your expertise to our listeners? Sure, absolutely. Um, I think people are fascinating. I think people are amazing. And a lot of people don't realize how amazing they are. And that makes it hard for the people who need them and their amazingness to find them. So I help people figure out how to rock out their personal brand in a bigger, bolder way, especially on social media. Got you. And then getting into that, what are the benefits of crafting a personal brand? Because people are kind of like, well, should I really do this? Do I really need to do this? Is it really that important? I mean, I have a job. Do I really need a personal brand? Well, here's the thing about that. We, you have a personal brand, whether you have taken control of it and ownership of it or not. Your per, I like to say that your personal brand is just the version of you that lives in someone else's head. And hopefully you are taking up some of that real estate in someone else's head. Hopefully you are making an impression. And so personal branding work is just about taking greater control over that impression, over thinking about how it comes across and what you put out there. And as for the argument that you don't need a personal brand if you have a job, first of all, it can make you a far more valuable asset to your company because if you are magnetic, that benefits your company. I have a job. I work for Social Media Pulse, which is a new community uh, started by Agora Pulse. And that was a huge asset. The fact that people know me, I can bring amazing levels of people in to help us out. Um, so my personal brand is a huge asset to my employer. There's also the fact that your employer may not always be your employer. We're seeing huge, huge rounds of layoffs every single week. And the people with strong personal brands are the ones landing on their feet and taking their next position as a level up rather than just grabbing something out of desperation. So your personal brand is really important, even if you have a solid position. Mm. Yeah. I mean, let's say someone does get layoff and they want to start this because they didn't really do anything with it. They kind of just was like, I'm just posting things to post things because I mean, yeah. sometimes we, we do that. So how would you start to do this <laughs> to help maybe get that next job or help start your own business? One really big thing, and people hate this part, I hate this part, is, is figuring out who needs to know who you are and why. The why is really the killer question there because what you're really asking for when you put any sort of content out there when you're putting your personal brand out there anything like this you're asking for people's valuable attention and our attention spans are are crazy nowadays so attention is really valuable commodity so if you're going to be asking someone for that valuable attention how are you going to make it worth their while who are you speaking to why do they need to hear 
you when there's so many other people try to speak to them. That's a really important thing to, to bear in mind, whether you're building a personal brand, whether you're a content creator, or even if you're just a job seeker. Because of course, the people who are hiring and recruiting and all of that, they also have a ton of people who want their attention. And they also have a ton of people who um, they want to, who want to stand out to them. And so why you? What is going to make you stick in their mind so that when someone sees a position that is relevant, they know that you're the person for it. If you're general, if you're bland, if you haven't put out there who you are and what you want, people aren't going to know how to help you. That's really, really key. I just saw this very morning. I saw someone on LinkedIn posting about a position opening at their company. And two people I know stuck in my heads immediately, not for the vague reasons of they're in the social media industry. It was specifically, oh, this person would get that brand. I'd love to see what that person would do working for that brand because I have a version of that person in my head that sends out certain signals to me that this resonated with. So if you don't put it out there, you're not going to have those signals if you're going to blend into the background. So basically the toughest question is why, why should, why should I be doing this? Why should people care about me and why should I be posting stuff or even networking sometimes? Cause that was a networking thing through LinkedIn. You're like, Oh, these people would be great yeah. for this tips to figure out that why first. Cause that's a big question. Why? Yeah. I've been delving into this a lot myself, um, which is, you know, just kind of look back, look back at the things in your life, the situations in your life that have just lit you up inside, where you felt like you performed really well, where you felt really aligned with what you were doing, and look deeper. Don't look at the task level. Don't look at the outside thing of, oh, I liked working for that company, or I liked having that job description, or I liked doing that activity in my personal life. Go deeper, go beyond the task level and answer the question of, what was I really doing there? What position was I really in, in terms of the grand machinations of whatever was happening around me? What was I doing, not what circumstance was I in? And you'll start to see patterns. You'll absolutely start to see patterns. When I, when I did this for myself, I discovered that I really love telling people's stories. I think that people are fascinating, as I said at the top of this. I think that everyone has stories to share, and I think people don't know how to share them. And so when I was a journalist, I loved telling people stories and saying, hey, here's this cool person doing amazing stuff. Uh, when I was a social media manager, I was helping people learn how to show everyone the amazing stuff they were doing, which is what I do as a personal brand strategist. I help people figure out how to tell their stories in a way that people will hear it so that they can help those people. And I'm, I'm a journalist again now. I'm, I'm the editor of Social Media Pulse. And so again, it's about finding amazing people and giving them a, a platform to tell their stories so that the people who can really learn from them and really benefit from those stories and that expertise and that knowledge can hear them. Gotcha. And then even going with that, why should you do the why am I on social media platforms if you're pick and choose which ones? Because even for a personal brand and even for companies, we always say don't be on everything. So should you yeah. transition that to your own personal brand where you don't have to be on everything? Absolutely. You don't have to be on everything. That becomes more of a chore than a joy. And there, there's two schools of thought here um, about where to be, what platforms to be on. Some people say, and rightly so, be where your audience is. Because if the message you're sharing is on the wrong platform, it's going to fall upon the wrong ears. But I think even more important is where will you shine? Where will you not hate showing up all the time? Because if you are one of those people who just hates the sound of your own voice, don't start a podcast. Don't go on Clubhouse. You know, you're going to do much better if you can, you know, blog or something like that, or maybe have, you know, a bunch of brilliant Twitter threads. Uh, similarly, if you're not so great with words, I mean, maybe Twitter will be frustrating for you. Maybe LinkedIn will be frustrating for you. You know, where do you want to be? If you're like me and you love video, pretty much every platform is rocking video now. I am about to correct a great wrong, which is that I have spent years not caring about my YouTube channel. 
And so I'm about to launch into starting to actually care about it because, you know, if video is my thing, which it is, I need to take the video platform a little more seriously than I have been. So it's an ongoing process. It's a journey. All the platforms are changing all the time. So um, it can change where you are for sure. But be where you'll show up because showing up is really the key to gathering a community and showing up and engaging. And if it's someplace that you hate going and you want to get in and out as quickly as possible, you're not going to put in that work and you're not going to show your best sides. Hmm. To be fair, I don't really, I used to not like editing my own voice. It is a thing yeah. where people are just like, I, I just try to quickly get through it. Even though I love podcasting, there is some aspects where you're like, I just don't like listening to my own voice for whatever reason. Everyone thinks their own voice sounds weird because it sounds differently in our heads. And then we hear it recorded and it's higher and it's weird and, you know, but you just got to get over it. That's one of the great things about consistent content creation. You just do it and you learn to gradually get over it. Everyone feels weird on video at some point, especially at the beginning. It's just a fact. And the more of it you do, the more you just kind of get past it, get through it. It's almost like, oh, I've heard this before, so it doesn't bug me as much. But it's like the first, yeah. I think for me, it was like a couple of years in. I was like, okay, I'm finally over this. It takes a while. Also, keep in mind, people aren't sitting there analyzing the exact timber of your voice the way that you are for yourself. <laughs> they want to hear the information you're bringing. If you're conveying quality information, they're not going to nitpick your delivery. It's true. And even going on that, what mistakes should people avoid for their own personal brands? Because it's kind of like people are like, I'm going to do this. And it's like, well, I didn't actually accomplish this at all. <laughs> the biggest thing to avoid is trying to be all things to all people. Because again, you'll be bland. You'll blend into the background. You want to be the person where there's just a handful of things where people think of you for that. Because then they'll know how to help you. I was just kind of a generalist. I thought I was not a generalist. I thought I had niched down. I was social media for small business, but I wasn't getting called upon to speak as an expert on things um, because it was so generic. Everything that I was an expert on, there was someone else who was a deeper expert on an element of that. And then around August, 2020 is when I decided to really lean into the personal branding thing because it brought me satisfaction. And it was something that people externally were noticing about me. They already had me as personal branding girl in their heads when I hadn't even done it. So I said, let's let's lean into that hard. Let's just define as personal branding girl. And suddenly I was speaking at way more events. I was appearing on way more podcasts like this one and live streams and things like that because people knew what to call upon me for. So there's a huge advantage to figuring out what you're gonna own. And here's the thing. People are afraid of niching down because they think it'll pigeonhole them and they won't get other opportunities. They think it will limit their opportunities. First of all, it will maximize your opportunities because people know what kind of opportunities to throw your way. It's, it's really helpful. But also, you can still do other things. Like, this is just the thing you want to set off in people's heads of, oh, she's personal branding girl, for example. But then once you develop relationships with people, they learn, oh, I also love talking about community. I also really love events and can talk about how to make great connections at events. I'm a huge connector and networker. I can talk about that. And then you get to do those things. But first, you have to get in the door. You have to prove to people that you are worth their attention. And then you can open up those other avenues of opportunities as well. Yeah. I mean, even podcasts, the, the thing is to niche yourself down. I think what people forget is that you don't stay in that niche forever. You eventually branch out, yeah. but you have to start somewhere. Yeah. And you can change it too. That's the interesting thing. I, I've had a few shifts with my personal brand and each shift has been powered by my personal brand. When I started having a personal brand that people were really taking notice of and, and people who didn't know me suddenly knew who I was, I was a local journalist. My influence was hyper local. It was pretty niche. And so how have I leveraged that into then being a social media expert and then leveraged that into being a personal branding expert? Uh, part of it is because the core is the same. Some of my core values have remained the same, loving, amplifying other people's stories, uh, confidence, optimism. A lot of those core things were the same that appealed to people about me and I was able to leverage them into the next step. But um, a lot of it also was just being, being consistent 
yet clear. So I didn't show up seeming like a totally different person when I made those shifts. I was clearly the same person, the same things about me appealed to people. It's just now I was talking a lot more about something else. And that, that happened somewhat gradually. And it wasn't such a departure that the people who had been listening to me previously talk about whatever I was talking about before were not interested in this new thing that I was talking about. They came along for the journey. Something, some attachment there remained. And it meant that I was able to start the next phase not from scratch, which is really key. And that's another huge thing that strong, authentic personal branding can do for you, which is that if you decide to change up what you're doing, you won't be starting from zero. You'll be starting with a certain kind of baseline level of support. As long as you've been honest and straight with your audience already about who you are, what you care about, what you stand for, you can change the surface level application of that thing. It gives you that freedom. Mm. And is there any recommended tools you use to do all this stuff? Because I mean, pictures, videos, everything. I mean, you have to have something to, to actually use for tools or even monitoring yourself as well. Absolutely. Well, one big thing that I want to say is you don't need any tools to start. You have a smartphone, you have a camera in your laptop. That's truly all you need for video or for audio. Like really, really don't get caught up in the tech and think that it's a barrier. Again, if you're conveying a valuable message, people will care less about your delivery. And then once you get into the habit of it, and once you're solid on your messaging, then you can certainly uh, upgrade your tech, upgrade the things that you use to help you make it easier. I mean, I've been paid for client videos back in the day when I was doing social for clients with videos that I shot on my iPhone and edited them on the free version of iMovie that was on my iPhone. And, you know, because I had certain elements of, of visual storytelling down, I was able to make those be valuable. Um, what I use now, uh, first of all, in my video studio here, I do have lighting. I'm about to change my lighting scenario, but, you know, people who are big tech geeks rag on ring lights. Ring lights are so useful. I love ring lights, but I've also got a, an Elgato key light that I have to figure out how to use properly. I have some umbrella lights. Um, so I'm still digging into how to upgrade my studio. I normally am using a DSLR camera. I have my Sony a6000 and it's, it's connected via cam link. Right now I'm not using that. Right now I'm actually, this is just what is on my MacBook Pro. And I think it's pretty darn good. So, <laughs> um, so even though I have tech, I'm, I'm doing fine with the with kind of the basic. And then my microphone, I use a Blue Yeti. It's a lot of people's first real microphone. If they get really hardcore into podcasting or something, they'll often upgrade. I might upgrade at some point in the future. But for now, my Yeti has been great. I've been fine with it. As for what I use uh, when I edit videos, I'm a big fan of Final Cut Pro. I find it easy. And I've started using Adobe Premiere at work and I find it much more confusing. There's stuff you can do in Premiere that you can't do in Final Cut. I still like the simplicity of Final Cut a bit better. Um, I love Canva. I have training in graphic design. I know how to use Photoshop. I know how to use Illustrator. I know how to use all these things. Canva is just so easy and it's always there and you can just whip something together really quickly. So I, I really do love Canva. I love Giphy. I'm a big fan of GIFs or GIFs if you're so inclined, but I'm a GIF person. And um, I love that. I put those together again, just on my computer and using Final Cut Pro or whatever. And then I chop them up and I upload them to Giphy and I use their editor to add the captions and things. So I'm a big fan of that. I feel like there's something really huge. Oh, massive thing to make your life easier as a content creator. Huge, huge, huge. Batch creating stuff. So, so, you know, sitting down and recording a bunch of videos in a row or a bunch of podcasts in a row or creating a bunch of blogs in a row and chopping them up into social posts, whatever batch creating. So you make, you focus on one type of content and just make a bunch of it and then using a scheduler to schedule them out. One day I took 15 minutes to brainstorm a bunch of frequently asked questions that I, I got asked. And then I spent about two minutes per question, just answering them on video, just off the cuff. I didn't script it. I just said, okay, here's a question people ask me, ask me, 
here's my answer. I answer that without a script every day. So why not? Chopped those up. And I had three months of weekly content from that. And it was incredible. So I definitely think that batch creation and a scheduler makes it so much easier. You can think about it a couple times a year if need be. It's beautiful. Uh, my scheduler, my scheduler of choice um, has been Agora Pulse since long before I worked for them. Um, but there are, of course, other schedulers out there. And here's the key: use a scheduler that also gives you some data that will also tell you how your posts are performing, and connect those dots for you as to optimal. Um, times to post on the different platforms. Don't go with a generic study someone did about best times to post places because that's not your audience. Hopefully the tools that you're using can tell you when your audience tends to be online or when your audience tends to be the most responsive and what they tend to be responding to so that the next time you go create and schedule a whole batch of content, it's going to go farther for you because you have that data of, okay, this type of stuff did the best. So I'm going to make more of this and less of that. And here's when I can tweak the timing of that post so that more people will hopefully see and engage. And that's constantly evolving. And hopefully as your audience, hopefully your audience is constantly growing. So that by itself is going to evolve their behavior. Mm. Yeah. I mean, that, that all makes sense. I probably would add DaVinci Resolve because I do have a good free version as well uh -huh. to that. So I'll, cause that's a video, actually it's a video editing DAW color grading, which they're known for their color grading and everything else. And Ooh. there is a free version for it. You know what I'm about to start using more? I'm going to start playing a lot more with Descript because I want to put captions on my videos more. A digital accessibility is, um, more on everybody's minds nowadays. My friend Alexa Heinrich is the little accessibility angel on a lot of people's digital shoulders. <laughs> so uh, she's got me thinking about adding captions to everything. And so Descript not only adds captions, it helps with editing because it transcribes, but then you can edit via the transcription. So you can look for every place you said, um, and it can just take them all out. Or um, I'm about to do a super cut as a promo for the next season of my show, a super cut of people saying that's a good question. Because I get a lot of those in my interviews. And, you know, that's great. So I'd love to have this super cut of these brilliant people I'm interviewing say, that's a good question. Or I haven't been asked that before. And I'm going to, it's going to be so easy with Descript. I can just search for those words and it'll identify those clips for me. So I'm looking forward to that, making um, content repurposing from rich content, like big, long videos, being able to make little short things for social media. Um, it's going to be a lot easier when I can just search for words. <laughs> and it'll take me to that exact spot of the video. It is a good tool. I've used it. It's just, I'm always trying to get around the subscription plans because there's like subscription plans for everything. And it, it's yes. starting to annoy me quite a bit. Same, same. So, but I mean, people who work for, for SaaS companies got to make a living too. <laughs> it's fair, but I mean, Adobe's like 60 something dollars a month for yeah. all their stuff. And I'm like, yeah. mm, I'm probably going to move away from this. <laughs> It bothered me a lot when Adobe went to a subscription model because I'm like, why did I buy all this software a few years ago? Why doesn't it work? Yeah. <laughs> what if I only need Photoshop once a month? Yeah, then you buy that yeah. one month and then you cancel again. <laughs> yeah. That's how you do it. But thankfully, thankfully work pays for my Adobe suite. Um, but before that, I, I just didn't really it, it annoyed me. Oh yeah. I mean, <laughs> I've found almost every alternative that's non subscription. So I probably could tell everybody what to do to make all this stuff with a non-subscription model. <laughs> yeah. And you know, the expensive stuff isn't always what you have to use. There's plenty of cheap stuff that does it. You know, what's a good uh, video editor that I like that's kind of like the Canva of video? Wave. Wave.video. Um, it, it does cost money, but um, I think there's a free plan. Um, and much like Canva, I pay for Canva. Because it's it's use it's useful for me to have all my branding stuff locked and loaded in there. I have fonts that I paid for, um, that I uploaded to Canva, so it's useful for me. And same with Wave, I've uploaded all my branding assets in there. You know, my logo, my fonts, my color palette, all of that. And um, Wave Video is a pretty easy way to edit things on the go on the web. Again, it's not going to be as sophisticated as you know what, an Adobe product, but you don't always need that. Sometimes it's simplicity, getting it done, 
it makes it enables you to get more done sometimes because you don't have the added hurdles of learning deep tech. <laughs> yeah, trust me, I'm still learning DaVinci Resolve. It's quite powerful. <laughs> <laughs> but should you create a persona for your personal brand or should you just be yourself? Cause I mean, I think we all know that social media, if you say the wrong thing and sometimes it's completely accidental you, or it's 10 years ago when things were way different from them, should you create a persona and stick with that instead of being your true self, just because you want to hedge your bets, I guess, and make sure that you're not saying something wrong accidentally. I cannot imagine having the energy or the bandwidth to give myself the entire extra job of pretending to be a different person. <laughs> I mean, I think that part of why people feel like personal branding itself can ring a little false is because you do have to sort of define your parameters for what you're doing um, as your personal brand. So in that way, it is a bit of a persona but it's a persona that is completely pulled from reality, or at least should be. Um, you should basically amplify the things that you want to amplify. Don't put everything on your professional social media. There's all sorts of personal things that uh, Christine Gritman Inc.'s audience don't really need to know. But, um, you know, I, I say it, it has to really come from reality and it has to flow from your reality. Um, because as I said, first of all, just laziness. I mean, I can't imagine giving myself that whole extra job. <laughs> just make things easier on yourself. It's so much easier to figure out how to be your most awesome you than it is to figure out how to be someone totally different. But then also don't draw those parameters too tight. Because if you're all business and if you're, you're really avoiding imperfection, People will tune you out because you won't be relatable. The thing that really gets you in people's heads, and again, your personal brand is the version of you that lives in people's heads. The way to get that in into people's heads is through their hearts. Uh, that sounds so cheesy, but it's true. And the way to do that is if they resonate with something. If you share a vulnerability, again, you don't have to get too private. You don't have to share like your medical history, unless that's you can. Um, but if you share something, that other people can relate to. And it's clearly not something that you said, well, this is a safe vulnerability to share. Like, don't make it seem too workshopped in your head. Just share what you're going through. Share what you're thinking about. Share what your concerns are. Share what your pain points are. Just share what you're going through. And it doesn't have to be just negative. It can also be celebrating things. But if you share from that point of real feelings and real reality and what you're really experiencing... Other real people who are really experiencing that will feel like it resonates with them and they'll feel a connection to you. And that's the best way to become someone who they want to continue to follow because they feel like they know you. There are so many people online who I feel like I know and I, I want to meet them all. Um, but a lot of that comes from the fact that I know that every set of words we exchange is not overthought out. A lot of it is just conversing like humans because we're humans who converse. Mm. <laughs> well, it's, it's true. So, I mean, obviously you could took it from more of a movie perspective. Nobody likes perfect characters in movies because even yeah. though they deal with adversities, it doesn't seem like it's that big of a deal to them. So, yeah, I mean, don't be a mess, but <laughs> I, I interviewed someone, I interviewed my friend Michaela Alexis about the diff the line between <clears throat> vulnerability and hot mess, essentially. And, and she phrased it really nicely. She said, vulnerability is when you're giving something to your audience and hot mess is when you're demanding something from them. You're demanding their support. You're, you know, demanding their energy and being your you know, shoulder to cry on or whatever. So there, there are lines there for sure. Um, but yeah, just, just keeping it real and not overthinking everything you do. And once you do have those parameters in your head of who your personal brand is, it becomes easier to do that. It becomes more natural to figure out what to say within those parameters in a way that's not overthought. 
Gotcha. And then, I mean, you could even go with this from a Joseph Campbell point of view of the hero's journey. You could do through many yeah. hero's journeys throughout because we have many ones throughout our lives. So almost like sharing that hero's journey with your audience or your personal brand or using that could also help you as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. Gotcha. And then like, like going into that, is it more difficult to share yourself because of how tribalistic it seems to it can be through social media? I mean, I've, we've, I feel like we all feel it. I mean, we get mad at people, but it feels like if you yeah. do one thing wrong and it, like I said, it may be completely innocent. You have no idea, but this one group <laughs> is like, Ooh, you've, you've, we have our 10 commandments and you really hit that one commandment that we don't like. Is it, mm -hmm. does it feel like it's hard to share that because you're like, I don't want to step on anybody's toes, but eventually you will step on somebody's oh, toes. Oh, goodness. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's like mean girls. It's like middle school. It's, you know, one toe out of line. But here, here's the thing to keep in mind about that. First of all, as with all things as humans, we hear this about business reviews and things like that too. Um, the negative tends to stick in your head more. So, you know, don't focus as much on, oh God, people are constantly, you know, mobbing on people on social media and freaking out on them. I don't even want to get into that lest I do something wrong. Look at every single day where people are showing support and, you know, not making a mess and not jumping on you. So there's that, you know, put it in perspective. We seem to think that the online uh, piling on people and canceling is a bigger deal than it is just because it's sort of the sort of thing we focus on. But when it comes down to it, if you're not putting anything out there that someone could potentially react negatively to, if you're playing it super duper safe, you're also not putting things out there that people are going to relate to as deeply. Because when you express, I'm not saying go out there and try to start fights. I'm not saying be a contrarian. But the fact is, if you are brave enough to express something that someone else is already thinking, they're going to feel such a connection to you. So don't necessarily try to do that, but recognize that anything that you do wrong, potentially, anything that people might um, start in with you for, there's going to be some other people in your corner. There's going to be, you know, maybe people are ragging on you on the timeline, but then there's going to be people in your DMs saying, oh my God, thank you. And by the way, I've got your back. Um, don't go out of your way to create those situations. Again, I, be I believe in keeping the internet a nice place and a happy place. But if it's something that you feel strongly with, if it's like a moral issue and you're like, look, I just have to say something. Um, you know, don't be too afraid of that. Don't be so afraid of being on brand that it makes you not be human. And I'd also point out another side to um, to what you termed the tribalism of the internet, which is that's also what gets you incredible support. You know, there's also tribes that you belong to. There are there and putting more of yourself out there again will identify you to those people and have them kind of welcome you in. So it's, it's a double-edged sword for sure. Another thing to point out is that internet kerfuffles tend to blow over a lot faster than you think. Um, I, I can think of a few dramas, thankfully, that I haven't really been a part of, but you know, they, they've blown over. And, and you just got to move on from that. Just make sure that if you are going to blow things up, if you are going to drop that bomb on your timeline, uh, make sure it's something you actually care about. <laughs> Don't do it for the clicks. Because as you point out, it can have a really bad result. Don't do it for the clicks. Really think about what you're putting out there on that level. If it's something that could offend. Or if you put something out there completely innocently. Just talking off the cuff. You don't think anything of it. And it doesn't seem like anything particularly controversial. And then people nail you on it. Um, the tricky part with that is really balancing listening and learning and growing with figuring out what you have to tune out. So really look at if, if someone is just jumping on the pile, you need to realize that person doesn't matter because how much influence do you think that person has really if they're that sort of person who just goes along with things? Whereas if it's someone who you already respect, someone who you actually do think, um, someone who you're aware of <laughs> says, hey, you messed up here that's the time to listen and grow 
And that's the time to show the vulnerability, the human vulnerability of owning it and saying, oh, hey, guys, I didn't think anything of this. I realize now I just wasn't thinking. And thank you for changing my thinking. And here's why I realize it was it was not the best thing to say. So I'm learning and growing. Some people will still hate you. That's just the way humans are. But the people who matter might respect it. So, so basically, it's tricky. avoid saying you're sorry just to say you're sorry just to get out of something because you hurt offended somebody you may not even know for the most part. So be Yeah, don't be like sorry you were offended. Instead say sorry I didn't realize this element of it and I see it now and I'm sorry. Yeah, so be basically be mindful of your apology and at least figure out if it should be an apology or you're just like, I'm just going to let this go. I'm just going to let it blow over. If I don't even know what I did wrong, I'm not really going to apologize for something I never knew I did wrong. I mean, there's, I mean, I, I think there's a balancing point where you're like, okay, maybe I did do something wrong. So I'll apologize and be specific, but also mm -hmm. it's like, don't apologize for everything. Cause then, I mean, people just don't respect people yeah. that just blow over it either. The, the way you handle these things tells people a lot about who you are as a person, um, where your moral compass lies. Um, and not everyone's moral compass is the same. There's definitely people who help, have deeply held beliefs and opinions that I dramatically disagree with. And, and so their compass is not the same as mine, but I respect them because they, they're not, they're not coming into um dispute with my most deeply held values of you know where are they coming from with this are they trying to do harm um but but that's just me you know the internet is a, if it's not al gore's a series of tubes the internet is a series of relationships especially social media and just like human relationships in real life you know, the way you apologize, if you choose to apologize, or if you choose to write off a relationship over um, a disagreement, it's the same on the internet. It's just a lot bigger. And there's a lot more people who you aren't, who you don't actually have relationships with. And that's another thing to keep in mind. If you don't actually have a relationship, you know, you got, you got to take things with a grain of salt. <laughs> But yeah, that's that's some pretty good advice right there. And then moving on to what do you think personal branding is going to be in the future in the next five years? Are we going to be more about the meta metaverse, even though people have been making fun of the metaverse? Are we going to be more about like being multifaceted with maybe videos if you do videos, podcasting, all that stuff? Like, is it changing to be more like upfront, more content specific? Like, how is this going to all go out in the next five years? So I have been kind of resisting getting into all the Web3 hoopla. I've been resisting all of it. But of course, I've been educating myself on it as a professional. And so as much as I don't like to say it, yeah, I do think the metaverse is going to be a big part of things. I especially think the blockchain is going to be a big part of things. I'm hearing more and more about people with strong personal brands having their own NFTs and their own social tokens. Social tokens are a big, big thing in online communities. And ultimately, your personal brand, you kind of want to amass a community around you. As much as I, I don't own a single NFT, I own no cryptocurrency, I'm not into social tokens. That being said, play this back to me in two years. I might have all of those things just because that's that's kind of the direction things are going. And I think that the things that draw people to you in Web3, the things that draw people to you in the metaverse, the thing that draw people to you in these online communities, uh, I'm not getting into cryptocurrency, but um, you know, those kind of social tokens and things like that, I think that those actually will be at play and those will attract people in different ways. But the main thing to keep in mind is, that will still be just one avenue. You can still build an online community if you sit out certain elements of the online experience, just like you can now. You can build an online community if you are 
only on Twitter. You know, no matter how popular, you know, Clubhouse or TikTok or whatever it may be, you can still build where you want to build because there are still people there. So if you're a resistor <laughs> Web3, don't worry that it means that you can't build a strong personal brand. And don't worry that it means that you can't amass a community around you. People are people. Wherever you can reach them, it's still going to be valid. I mean, we're podcasting here. The fact that podcasts blew up um, in the wake of online video <laughs> is fascinating because video you would think would be doing better and leaving podcasting in the dust because video feels so much more immediate. Um, I think especially with the pandemic and people getting zoomed out and people simultaneously getting more comfortable with video and more sick of video, I think that that's, re that's been responsible for a resurgence in audio social. The fact that Clubhouse and Twitter spaces have come out. The fact that podcasting, which has already been a popular thing for a long time, is getting a resurgence. LinkedIn has their podcasting network and they're going to start having um, podcast listening abilities. YouTube is is starting an interface for podcasters. You know, it really, and then as I said, things like audio spaces on all the platforms pretty much are starting to get them now. You would think that that was moving backwards and it's not because it's just a shift in the way people want to connect. And I think the fact that audio, which is essentially hearkening back to radio, the fact that audio social not only still has a place, but it's a growing place shows that it doesn't have to be about the shiniest or most immersive next technology. It's just about how humans want to connect. And so however you enjoy connecting to humans, there will still be a place for you, even if you don't go hard into the metaverse. However you want to express yourself, that's what's going to show your personal brand the best, and that's what's going to amass a community for you the best. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, Web3, it's one of those things where I think the blockchain is going to be the real thing in Web3 and everything else is just a after effect of blockchains. So, I mean, I'm... And I'm only just now starting to understand where all those lines are. I don't claim to be an expert, but yeah, the blockchain is really kind of the the netting that holds it all together. But again, you you can opt out. It is possible. Yeah, I mean, cryptocurrency, I would stay away from it for a while. <laughs> it's not doing very well. And because I'm somewhat involved, understand it to a certain extent. Yeah, I mean, staying away from this for a little while as it resolves itself and people figure out what really cryptocurrency is really going to be all about is probably the best way. I understand creator coins or social tokens, but still, I mean, that's still it's really infancy where it's you still have to know mm -hmm. what you're doing. And that's the bigger yeah. problem with it right now. It's not really accessible to everybody right now. So yeah, no, it's a big learning curve. Yeah, it's a huge learning <laughs> learning curve. I'm still trying to learn it, and I understand portions mm -hmm. of it, but I'm still trying to learn that part. So yeah, Web 2.0 right now, I still think for about five years or more is probably where you should reside, and then eventually get into Web 3 when they start to actually standardize it a lot more. It's not very standardized right now. Yeah, true. And then fun question for you. If you had nothing to do all day, you had your free time, what would be your way of relaxing? Doing nothing. People have forgotten how to do nothing. Like I, it's really interesting. So a few months ago, um, I got COVID. It finally hit me and it was short and mild. Thank God. Um, but the fact is I was almost bummed when I had to leave quarantine, quite honestly, because <laughs> I love the fact that I had to be all alone in my room. My family didn't get it. Um, I have a husband and two kids and none of them got it because I, I stayed in my room and I did a lot of nothing. I, I watched some TV, which I hadn't done in a while, but I just binged some ne some Netflix. I, I read a little bit, but a lot of it was just kind of napping or lying around, just kind of getting lost in my own thoughts. I would love a day of doing nothing. Hey, you got nothing to do all day. That's your <laughs> way of relaxing. That's the, that's your best way of doing it. So, Hey, I mean, yeah. I got COVID. 
I value nothingness. I, I reject the the hustle productivity culture. We there there is a place for doing nothing and resetting and relaxing and just being. It's lovely. Mm. I got COVID too. Uh, unfortunately, it was the last day of a cruise, but. Ooh. Luckily, it was the last day though, so I didn't ruin the whole Ooh. cruise. But yeah, I understand. Mine was pretty mild too, which I mean, I, th- I thought was more annoying than anything else. Even though some people were like, mm-hmm. "Well, you didn't look like you were annoyed." I'm like, yeah, I was pretty annoyed because I yeah. expected more of COVID, and I didn't really get it. <laughs> I mean, thank God. I know people who have lost loved ones. I know people who are suffering from from long haul COVID. Um, so I don't want to be flippant yeah. about it. But mine was very mild and. It was, it, I got the gift of doing nothing for a few days while um, feeling kind of crappy, but not so crappy I couldn't enjoy all the nothing. Yeah, granted, like it, it, it has killed a lot of people. So I'm not trying to be mm. flippant of that. It's just funny when it's just like yeah, yeah. when everybody tells you how terrible it is and you finally get it, you're like, wait, what? Yeah. Anyways, where can people find you online? People can find me all over the place. I am the only Christine Gritman, which is pretty cool. And that's G-R-I-T, like when something's gritty, like sand, and M-O-N, like Monday. So Christine Gritman, everywhere. Um, I'm C. Gritman on Twitter and Instagram, Christine Gritman, Inc. on Facebook and YouTube. Um, You know, Christine Gritman and Christine Gritman, Inc. on LinkedIn. Um, Yeah, all over the place. All right. And any final thoughts for listeners? Um, my, my biggest thing is you're more awesome than you think. People are going to be more interested in you than you think. You have more valuable gifts than you think. The fact that something comes easily to you does not mean it's not valuable to someone else. So just don't be afraid of that. Recognize what makes you special and you owe it to the world to put it out there. All right. Thank you for Christine for coming on to PR 360 and sharing your knowledge on personal branding. Thank you for having me, Brad. And thank you for listening to PR360. As always, please subscribe to PR360 on all your favorite podcasting apps. Leave a five-star review. It really does help with the rankings. And join us next week as we talk to another great thought leader in the PR industry. All right, guys, stay safe. Get to understanding your personal brand and get it roaring this year. And see you next week. Later.